Okay, so we've spent the last day talking about data. And you've heard each one of us go on and on and on about a lot of data that you can collect and that you should collect, okay? We're gonna be at Corrup National Park and we're gonna be at a pretty neat camp within it. And for the Cameroonians in the room, that might be something that you can do once or twice a year or maybe even once a month. But even for you guys, it's a significant investment of time. For me, I first wanted to come to the Cameroon Mountains and Cameroon in general 30 years ago. It took me 30 years to get here, okay? And watch Mark when you're in the field with him. He's commented to me at least every half hour since we got here, town, we're in Cameroon. Okay, so if you're going to go to all this trouble, you really need to make sure that all of your data are well taken care of. So here's where I'm going to be the pessimist, and I'm going to criticize everybody, including myself, okay, because basically this concept does not exist. Okay, it doesn't work. What we do to try to get to that 100% data security is replication. I'll go into why in a moment. But I just wanted, wanted to show you. Here's the label on a specimen tag, and we're going to be sitting there and writing that out. And here's our field catalog. And we're going to write the same information here as we wrote here. And when Mark is cataloging these specimens back in Kansas, if he finds that you didn't bother to write down the latitude longitude in either place, he will criticize, usually me, right? Same thing for tissues. There's the tissue tube and there's the tissue catalog. And much the same information goes on both. Rafe is looking at me like, oh, Damn, when is he going to start getting on me because all I do is I take that number, right? I'll get there, don't worry. So what does 100% data security mean? <coughs> the herpetologists are going like, ah, ah, no way. 100% data security means that data will be conserved in the original archival form without loss, corruption, or de degradation. To get to zero chance of loss is our goal. And that can take two or many different forms. A catastrophic loss is where you just lose everything. Right? The whole thing goes away. The entire data record or the entire collection. Or you can have incremental loss, which is just to say that you lose a bit of information here or there. So can we get to 100% data security? So let's go through some scenarios, okay? A small museum at a regional university had a small but significant collection. By the way, every one of these scenarios is real and has happened. All the specimens and catalogs were stored in one large collections room. The custodial staff had been saying that they were kind of getting a little bit of a smell of gas. And it'd been, they'd made that comment for weeks. And of course, the university administration paid them no attention. One staff member stepped out the front door to have a smoke. And the gas blew up the entire building. No one was killed. But the only things salvaged from the collection were the, the steel backs of the chairs. No specimens, no catalogs. So, Kate. Okay, let's do another catastrophic loss scenario. Our field crew goes out for a month, huge amount of work. Um, because they're trying to reduce processing time and maximize numbers of specimens, they decided to not write out full specimen tags. 
The information's in the field catalog, right? Specimens and field catalogs were stored separately during their long trip from the field site out to the capital. But the car and the field catalogs inside was stolen and never recovered. So that set of several hundred specimens was permanently without the full set of data. Now, I know you guys are pickling your specimens and probably writing out tags is not possible. But that's the risk you go. That catalog becomes crucial, right? That, by the way, happened to a bird team. Let's talk about incremental loss. Okay, field teams collected large numbers of specimens. The data were recorded on tags and in field catalogs, but the notes on habitats and details of localities were in the field notes only. The lead researcher, and this is something that Mark and I were involved in, the lead researcher always preferred to keep his field notes with him, even after he retired. And we asked him, could we please have your field notes? We'll make you very nice bound copies, but we really, really would like those field notes, please. He died. Former director of our museum. Our understanding is that there were seven or eight field notebooks. One of them appeared in the Lawrence Public Library used book sale and was donated back to us. The other six or seven are lost forever. So all of that ancillary data that Kate just told you about, gone. Okay, and that was something that Mark and I were working on for 15 years, knowing that this scenario could happen. You know, and we couldn't like, you know, go over and invade this person's house and demand the, the notebooks but the loss happened. Okay, full modern data secure KU expedition goes out. Everything was backed up and duplicated. We were working long hours. One preparator forgot to write down a measurement of body mass on both the tag and the catalog. Another preparator created two tissue tubes for two separate specimens of the same species and assigned them the same number. Another preparator forgot to tie tags on the two individuals of the same sex of the same species. Each of those caused incremental loss, just a little bit. <laughs> Hold on, this is, th this is about what might happen. Okay, these are what ifs. That's why you're taking notes on the presentation. Of course. So you all saw those really neat codes that Rafe had where he said that in 20 seconds, he can write out Kate's paragraph and a half of information. You had lots of codes in there. There were like six columns. On paper, it's great. 20 seconds per specimen, right? But maybe Rafe's career begins to lapse. Nobody cares about his future. Maybe he makes a wrong career decision. Moves to another institution. Moves to another institution. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's what was going on. So even though his specimens are deposited at a major US university museum, he has no more students, no more colleagues. Really, all anybody cares about Rafe at this point is the herps that he collects. And so his field notebooks, who knows what happens to those? The specimens and the field catalogs are there. And in the year 2035, some technician captures the last of Rafe's material. And they're like, what do those codes mean? Right? And Moses said the same thing. Moses said, these are my species codes, and each of you should invent your own species codes. And you really can't figure out my species codes unless I tell you what they mean. Oops. Okay. Mark and I have worked very hard to eliminate 
codification in our catalogs. I'm sure there's still bits. You can tell me next week if, if you spot something that if I die and Mark dies would not be interpretable. But definitely ornithology has done this. So you'll see when you're around the bird guys next week, bird crania pneumatize with age, which is to say initially they're one sheet of bone and then with age they turn into two sheets of bone with little bubbles in between. And it's essentially like a, light, a lightweight brain protection system. Uh, but we use it as a way of deciding how old the bird is. You know, is it months old or several years old? And so the correct term is pneumatized, but for s centuries ornithologists have said ossified. And so there are all these codes, S-C-O, skull completely ossified, S-N-C-O, skull not completely ossified, and then there are all these little variants on, you know, S-O, skull ossified, yeah, and, there, and there are all these codes and you never really know what the less common ones mean. So, yeah, this was about Rafe. I couldn't resist. You made too much of your cool system for codes. But if those little keys get lost or get dissociated with your specimens, or maybe you send 50 specimens to another institution, right? Okay, I won't, I won't mistreat Rafe anymore. So, I found this on the web, Murphy's Law for Data Centers, which is pretty relevant to Murphy's Law for biodiversity data. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. If it cannot possibly go wrong, it will still go wrong. Logic is a systematic method of coming to the wrong conclusions for your data center with high confidence. Okay, we've thought about it, this is the best decision. Guess what, you're wrong. The moment you take the strategic decision not to replicate data is the same moment when your single copy gets destroyed. Okay, when it comes to biodiversity data, believe it or not, Murphy was actually optimistic. Systems scheduled to be replaced on Thursday will fail on Wednesday. That's more for data centers. And a shortcut is the longest distance between two points. So it's funny, we all laugh about it. And guess what? It's totally true. Okay? So when we're out in the field for a week, one of the things I'll do for you guys is I'll say, hey, everybody, notice this. We just lost some data. Right? Uh, couldn't resist that. Closed today because everything that could go wrong did go wrong at the Center for the Study of Murphy's Law. So, do we believe it? Yeah, we really shouldn't. Now, what can we do to get close? You know, remembering that if, some, if I say this is 99.99% .99 fail safe, that means that it fails one time in 10,000. And if you do things 100,000 times, you're gonna hit one of those one in 10,000 events, those rare events. You know, you'll see we'll have a skinning table, and you think my skinning table is a table, it's inside a work tent, the work tent is under a tarp or a roof, it can't get flooded. And on that 1986 expedition in Brazil, there was a very sudden windstorm, rainstorm, and somewhere back in my slide collection from 30 years ago, I have pictures of field catalog pages hung on a clothesline drying. Okay, they're 100% rag paper and the ink is permanent ink, so they weren't destroyed. But what could go wrong did go wrong. So really the only approach that you can have to minimizing the probability of failure is multiple independent systems, each of which has a low probability of failure. 
And that way, if our probability of failure here is 0 0.00001, then we can reduce that substantially if there's a second system that does not interact with the first system that also has a low probability. So I write my tag and I write my catalog entry. The probability of the tag falling off the specimen is low. The probability of anybody getting my catalog away from me is low. You basically will have to kill me to steal my catalog at the end of this month in, in Cameroon. Okay? I'm serious about that. Um, so we fill out everything repeatedly. We double record for each different portion of the, of the data. Uh, we work on archival material, even in the field. And this is an interesting one. Catalogs and specimens are never stored together. Okay? My catalog, if you guys come, the, the Cameroonians at least, if you come here, when I come out of Rumpy Hills, every night my catalog will be under my pillow. Um, this is for ornithology. You see that? Sleep with your catalogs. Never trust anyone, right? <laughs> as soon as you get out of the field, you, you make photographs or photocopies of your catalogs. You can mail them to yourself. The probability that you get robbed of the catalog and that packet you mailed to yourself gets lost is very low. You can email it to yourself. You can upload it to Dropbox. You can say to Moses, hey, can you put this in your house please and the probability that something happens at the hotel and at Moses's house is relatively low 